Chapter 3 Soulfire, for all its importance in underpinning the magical arts, is not particularly well understood. This might be evident perusing the Belcaran Academy of Wizardry's course catalog, where there is only one course, Meta Theory of Magic, which mentions Soulfire in its description. This course will examine historical theoretical lenses through which we understand the inner workings of magic itself, including that most mysterious of topics, Soulfire. Students will study texts from wizards of the past, as well as modern interpretations, offered every third year, lectures held in the library boiler room. This much we know. All living beings generate soul fire. Some generate more than others. When an individual possesses a sufficient capacity for soul fire, that individual is capable of magic. Performing any kind of magic, whether incantations, sigils, potions, etc., drains soul fire, which takes time, food, and rest to regenerate. The rest is a mystery. What are the mechanics of soul fire generation? Why do some people's soul fire pools swirl clockwise and others counterclockwise? Why do my house plants generate tiny amounts of soul fire, and can I harness it to dry my socks? Contradictory answers to these questions litter the millennia of wizarding scholarship on the subject, most of which comprises virulent name-calling of scholars of the opposing viewpoint. To study soulfire is to be conversant in many dead languages' use of profanities, most of which are variations on he whose socks are wet. From the article Soulfire by Professor Tree Logan, Belcaran Academy Datastream Archives. Ninian woke the next morning to the orange light of the gas giant streaming through the window. She splashed icy water on her face from the tub faucet and dressed in her brown overalls and matching wizard's hat. She sat for a few minutes at the edge of her bed, unsure of Salagrix's expectations. Would he come to get her? Was she supposed to get started on chores? If she wanted that master's letter, it might be a good idea to show initiative. She climbed the stairs to see if Salagrix was awake. Gossamoff followed, pushing his chubby body over each step with determination. On the next floor, she found an open, doorless room, larger than the rooms on the first two floors, which explained the tower's precarious silhouette. The room was dark and windowless, so she cast and affixed a light spell to a lantern which hung by a chain from the ceiling. The lantern, annoyingly, was not in the center of the room— It appeared, from the pattern of stones in the ceiling and the floor, that someone had expanded this room at some point, but had not relocated the once central lantern. Once the room was lit, she took stock. Fungal growths, white and spongy, crept in between the stones of the floor and the walls. A triple set of wooden floor-to-ceiling shelves occupied half of the room's walls, filled with bizarre ingredients for every imaginable spell— Glass jars with eyeballs and crow's feet suspended in liquid, earthenware containers with large corks and handwritten labels like ground minotaur horn and rosemary, woven baskets overflowing with dried grasses and silvery bundles of hair, dried lizard heads hung from the ceiling next to bundles of garlic, ingredients spilled from many knocked-over containers onto the shelves and the floor. Along another part of the wall, a formidable wooden table held a mismatched assortment of tools, cauldrons from tiny to massive in a rainbow of metallic colors, scattered knives of silver and obsidian, a jar of wands, and a stained deck of divination cards. There were scraps of parchment across the table and the surrounding floor, as well as scrolls and open books. A chalkboard on wheels with half-erased sigils and equations hid a door which led to a magically enlarged storage closet, stuffed with cleaning supplies, empty crates, and a broken alembic. Like the apprentice's room, the workshop was damp and disused. Ninian steeled herself. Clean workrooms was at the top of the daily chores on the list. She rolled up her sleeves, ready to dive in, when she was interrupted by a grumble from her stomach. Breakfast would have to come first. There was a niche in this room as well, identical to the one in the sitting room on the first floor. Black coffee and a vegetable omelette, she shouted into the niche, uncertain if there were any limitations on what she could order. With a crack and a burst of crimson smoke, a steaming mug of coffee and an omelette on a clean white plate appeared in the niche. Thank you, she shouted, still unsure how to interact with the unseen kitchen demon. The coffee was fine, nothing special, 
but it was hot, and more importantly, it was coffee. They said the 12,000 worlds were settled and built on coffee, and right now, she believed them. The vegetables squished as she bit into the flavorless omelette. She ate what she could and gave Gossima her unfinished half, who gobbled it up with a wide smile and a little burp. She would need to find something that the demon made that was actually edible, because so far, she had had no luck. Her hunger satisfied, if not her palate, she assessed the room. But before she could get started, Saligrix peeked his face around the doorway and blinked at Ninian with an empty expression. The tip of his nightcap drooped down almost to his waist. Good morning, Ninian said, putting her breakfast plate into the niche where it vanished with a crack of smoke. Wasn't sure if I should go ahead and get started cleaning, or... When Saligrix's expression did not change, she added, As your new apprentice? This seemed to cause a cascade of recollections on the wizard's face, and he nodded repeatedly. Ah, yes, of course, the new apprentice, yes. Ninian laughed quietly to diffuse the awkwardness. Would she have to remind her master of her existence every day? Seligrick stepped into the room fully, and Ninian noticed, once again, how the fungal spores kicked up by his shuffling robes seemed to orbit him rather than take the expected meandering roots through the room. Several jars on the nearest shelf scraped towards him as if he exerted his own gravity. Very well, then. A fit of coughing cut off Saligrix. He pounded his chest and cleared his throat, which sounded like he was trying to dislodge a slug the size of a garden squash from his lungs. He recovered with a shake of his head. Let me prepare myself, and I will meet you here in the lower workshop when I am ready. We will go over your duties and begin the first lecture. In the meantime, you are welcome to order whatever you like from the kitchen demon. Ninian wanted to ask if there was anything actually worth eating, but Saligrix had already vanished up the dark stairwell. She still wanted to clean, but held herself back in case there were specific instructions incoming. Instead, she puttered around the room and then took a seat in the chair by the workbench to scroll on her device. Because of the differences in time on their various worlds, her parents back home were not available for a call, and neither was Drusilla, her best friend, who was also on her apprenticeship year. Ninian was eager to find out how her friend's assignment compared to hers. Gossima sniffed a large wicker basket on the lowest shelf, licked it, made a face, and then curled up on the floor and began to snore. Ninian was very curious to find out if Saligrix was a creature healer. After examining the ingredient shelves and the tools on the workbench, she wasn't able to make any specific guesses. Some materials were familiar, and others were not. The scribbles on the chalkboard were unintelligible to her. Just when she was about to search for information about him in the Belcaran Academy archives via the data stream, he appeared in the stairwell, dressed in the same dingy hat and robes from yesterday. A sock clung to his hip, and his face looked a little wet, as if he had been sweating. Ah, good, you're still here. Reassuring. Saligrix tottered over to the chalkboard. The chair you're in is fine, yes. Saligrix flicked his hand, and the chalkboard wiped itself clean. A tiny stub of chalk flew to the upper left corner of the board and hovered there, awaiting further instruction. Welcome to your apprenticeship. You will address me as Master Saligrix, a title befitting both my position as the Master Wizard of the Shadow Moon of Shadron, and your mentor for the duration of your time here. Do not let my reputation intimidate you. I assure you, any stories you may have heard about me are patently false. Saligrix chuckled here. But Ninian had never heard the wizard's name, much less of any reputation. Should she have? The first matter of business is your duties. Mornings will be your time for cleaning and maintenance of the tower, as well as other tasks. Here, Saligrix enumerated a list of chores that were the exact same, in the exact same order, as the list she had found in her room. The only exception was the conspicuous absence of secure perimeter, which was a relief on her part. In the afternoons, we will meet here in the lower workroom for lecture. Lectures on what? Ninian wondered. Creature healing? Oh, please, let it be creature healing. But Saligrix did not elaborate. The evenings are yours to do with as you wish. You are welcome to join me for dinner in the dining room, which is the floor above this one, or you may take your dinner wherever else you like, including in the town of Black Gulch. However, on account of the local nocturnal wildlife, which is known to be vicious, this is not recommended. Neither is dining in Black Gulch, whose accommodations are meager, and whose town folk are backwards, but you have been duly informed of your options. 
Because of my needs and the rigorous nature of your course of study, I could not accommodate requests for days off. Settle in. This tower will be your home for the duration of your apprenticeship. Any questions? For the moment, Saligrix appeared to have regained his presence of mind. His confusions seemed to come and go. Not about the schedule, said Ninian. She wanted some clarifications about the vicious nocturnal wildlife, but for now there was only one pressing question. But I am curious to learn what your discipline is. Saligrix looked at her askance. Why, portal craft, of course. Oh, so not creature healing. In her heart, the last vestiges of hope for a fun, engaging apprenticeship shriveled and died. What is your level of familiarity with the subject? Saligrix asked. Zero, said Ninian. She wasn't even sure the Academy offered courses on portal craft. She had never seen it in the course catalog, nor had she ever met a fellow student who had mentioned taking a class on the topic. Saligrix sighed. That is to be expected. Portal crafters are a dying breed, I'm afraid. No matter, since you are starting from zero, as you say, we will skip your chores this morning in favor of an extra lecture. The nub of chalk sprung to life, wrote portal craft in a neat blocky script, and then underlined the word. Why study portal craft? By Saligrix's presentational tone, Ninian realized the lecture had begun and hastily grabbed some spare parchment and the most functional-looking ink wand from the work table. In the last several hundred years, the advancement of spacecrafts that can travel between the stars has been, pardon the pun, astronomical. Saligrix paused here as if expecting laughter. He had taken on the airs of someone addressing a much larger room full of students in rapt attention. Despite Saligrix's obvious struggles with memory, Ninian got the impression that he had finally honed this speech over decades, and it remained perfectly preserved in the old lecturer's mind. One may wonder, what is the purpose of learning to craft portals using magic to traverse the stars by ancient art when one could simply hop on the next shuttle? Portals are more dangerous, more expensive, more unpredictable, and more time-consuming than spacecraft. Portals require the consideration of innumerable interlocking variables, large quantities of rare and costly ingredients, and sometimes days, if not weeks, of difficult calculations. The slightest error at any step can result in, at best, total failure, and at worst, death and calamitous destruction. Ninian realized she was leaning forward. In the light of these difficulties, there are those who say... Abandon the old ways. Your field is not relevant. We are discontinuing your courses from the curriculum. To them. To them, I say. Here, Saligrix adopted a defiant posture, arm across his chest, like a lone warrior standing his ground against an arena of adversaries. His eyes misted. Bully. The workroom was perfectly silent. Gossima yawned and smacked his lips. Bully to the naysayers, shouted Saligrix, getting worked up. We seek not the easy way, nor the efficient way, nor the cheap way. No, we seek the way of power. To feel the very fabric of space bend in our hands, that is the way of the wizard. This was hardly the ringing endorsement in favor of the study of portal craft that Ninian was expecting, but she had to admit that his enthusiasm was infectious. With that in mind he said. Let us begin. Hours later, after being dismissed for a brief break before dinner, Ninian found herself outside, in between the tower and that perfectly circular border of trees. The air was chilly. Ninian shivered and wished she had brought the scarf. Gossima rolled on his back in a patch of brown clover and then hopped towards the woods. Ninian followed her frog dog and the short dry grass crunched under her feet. Her mind was still reeling from the lecture, which had lasted all day. She felt plunged into a new world of terms and ways of thinking. Saligrix was obviously passionate. She recalled the way his eyes sparkled as he hinted at further secrets to be revealed. She understood none of it yet, but she might soon. By the end of the year, she might open a portal and cross the galaxy with a single step. That was intoxicating. Dusk approached. She reached the border of the forest and smelled the earth of the forest floor, 
and the curious sweetness of decay. As she watched Gossima hop and roll and play, she wondered if she had been too quick to judge her new apprenticeship assignment. True, she would still spend a year in a damp tower out in the middle of nowhere with a senile old wizard. True, portalcraft was not a subject she had ever considered studying or heard of, but she wasn't one to back down from a challenge. Portalcraft didn't have any connection to creature healing as far as she could tell, but the ability to travel to distant worlds without a spacecraft? That was intriguing. That was a very interesting opportunity. And if she could impress Seligrix with her effort and diligence, that master's letter and a career at the research department were hers. Ninian stopped short before entering the scraggly wall of trees and bushes. She was not yet sure if the forest was safe. Saligrix had mentioned vicious nocturnal wildlife, and the phrase secure perimeter on Rodanda's list still echoed in her mind. What had happened to the former apprentice anyway? Saligrix's memory appeared spotty, but perhaps when he was feeling sharp, Ninian might get more answers. Gossima sniffed hesitantly at a wilted purple-leafed fern. Not today, Gossi, Ninian said. It's getting dark. Maybe another time. Still, standing here at the edge, she felt the dark thrill of an invitation to enter and immerse herself in a tangle of living, growing things. The thrill did not diminish as she returned back to the tower. Back in her room, Ninian washed. She would have to figure out how to fix the cold water at some point because she did not enjoy freezing baths. Once dry, she took out her clothing options, which were few, as she traveled light. Saligrix hadn't specified a dress code for dinner, but she chose the one fancy outfit she had packed, a modest black dress with a matching cape. It might serve her to make a good impression at the first dinner of her apprenticeship. She and Gossima climbed the stairs to the floor beyond the lower workroom, into the dining room. A long wooden table spanned the room with a chair at either end. Dingy candelabras with stubby, flickering candles appointed the surface of the table, while a filthy rug lay underneath. Mountains of dust, grime, and fungus encircled the room where the floor met the walls, underneath a niche twice as long as the ones on the other floors. Saligrix was not here, nor had dinner been served. She could have waited, but her curiosity got the best of her, and she continued climbing the stairs to investigate the rest of the tower. On the next flight above the dining room, she found a wooden door, closed. She could feel the heat from the other side. Red light, tinged with the acrid scent of sulfur, spilled from the gap underneath the door. This, she assumed, was where the kitchen demon lived. She continued up the stairs and ran into Saligrix coming down. Ah! shouted the old wizard, and then, upon seeing her fully, No! He waved her back down the stairs with a shooing motion, shouting, Down! Down! They hurried into the dining room, and Saligrix took a seat at the chair closest to the doorway, panting. He leaned against the table, wheezing, and took a few moments to collect himself. Ninian assumed she had spooked him in the dark stairwell. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be short with you, said Saligrix when he had caught his breath, but I neglected to set clear boundaries this morning. He took another shuddering breath and steadied himself. My work on the upper levels of the tower is quite dangerous. When your skills in portalcraft advance, I may have use for you in the upper workshop, but until then I must ask you to confine yourself to this floor and the floors below. Ninian nodded, somewhat chastened. She hoped there were not too many more forgotten rules and secret boundaries she would stumble into. As Saligrix continued to pant, Ninian realized he was still wearing the same dirty gray robes from earlier that day. Overalls at dinner from now on, thought Ninian. Noted, and don't go above the dining room. Dinner! Saligrix shouted toward the large niche. Ninian heard a rumble like thunder, but then realized the sound was coming not from outside, but from the floor above. The thrumming swelled, and then, with the now familiar crack and burst of crimson smoke, a full silver-plated dinner appeared in the niche. I'm much too tired to get up again, Saligrix wheezed. Would you mind terribly setting the table, please? Usually, levitation spells were not worth the effort, as they drained a lot of soul fire, and it was easier just to carry things. But Ninian felt like showing off. With a few hand motions and a perfectly pronounced incantation, 
the silver dishes flew from the niche and arranged themselves prettily on the table. Saligrix clapped his hands and laughed. Well done, very good. Ninian took her seat with a flourish of her cape and a self-satisfied smile. The old wizard lifted a silver lid to reveal a steaming, blackened tunnel grouse. This is a treat, I must say. Rodondo eats alone, so my dinners are usually quite quiet. Ninian unfolded her napkin onto her lap. You mean, Rodondo ate alone? Hmm? Saligrix looked up from transferring a slice of grouse to his plate. You said Rodondo eats alone, but he hasn't been your apprentice for over twenty years, right? He's not here. The old wizard turned as if he had heard something fall in a nearby room. Right. Uh, yes. Rodondo is... gone. What happened to him? Do you remember? He left all his things here and never came back for them. Seligrick stared into the middle distance, and his mouth opened and closed wordlessly. Worried that she had sent her master into a stupor from which he would not return, Ninian turned her attention to the food in front of her. As a lover and caretaker of creatures, Ninian did not eat meat, so she passed on the tunnel grouse and instead filled her plate with limp, boiled vegetables and a wet salad. The kitchen demon's cooking once again left something to be desired. It was maybe time to look for alternate sources of nutrition. The scrape of a dish along the table caught her attention. She looked up to see a gravy boat inching ever closer toward Saligrix, as if tugged by an invisible string. Many other plates and cups were similarly creeping towards him. Um, the, uh, Ninian pointed towards the offending tableware. Saligrix looked up. Hmm? Uh, th the dishes, they're... Bah! Saligrix waved at the air as if batting an invisible fly, and the dishes stilled. Blasted side effects. Side effects? That was interesting. She was curious, but she didn't want to pry at the moment. Going directly at things seemed ineffective with Saligrix. Instead, she tried a different topic of conversation. I wanted to ask you about the woods around the tower, she asked after tossing a mushy carrot to Gossima. Are they safe to explore? Saligrix nodded as he finished chewing. In the day, generally speaking, yes, he said. The nighttime beasts are fierce enough that I would avoid them. But you needn't worry. The Dryad and I reached an agreement some years ago. You may have noticed the perimeter. Ninian nodded, expecting Saligrix to elaborate, but he did not. There's some sort of barrier, she prompted. Saligrix nodded as he wiped his beard with his napkin. The Dryad limits the plants and creatures of her woods from crossing the barrier of their own accord. We therefore avoid unnecessary entanglements. Saligrix's mention of creatures once again piqued Ninian's curiosity. The Twelve Thousand Worlds had a dizzying array of life, and one never knew what one might encounter on any given world. You must know quite a bit about the local wildlife, Ninian's curiosity came through. Saligrix made a face. I try not to pay attention, honestly. Her mentor's dismissive attitude did little to suppress her curiosity. She wanted to explore those woods as soon as she had an opportunity. Who knew what she might find? The rest of the dinner conversation was sparse, until the end when Saligrix, grunting, raised his arm. I suppose we ought to have a toast on the occasion of your new apprenticeship. He turned toward the niche and shouted, Pixie wine! A tray with a ruby bottle and two glasses appeared in the niche with the same bang and burst. Saligrix looked longingly at the wine. Ninian Soulfire had not regenerated from her earlier levitation spell, and so she fetched the tray herself. Thank you. Much appreciated, said Saligrix as Ninian poured two glasses and then returned to her seat. Saligrix raised his glass. To your apprenticeship. Ninian returned the toast and took a sip of the wine, which was thick and sweet. She could already feel the warmth softening the edges of her mind. Not daring to drink more, not on the first night of her new apprenticeship with her new mentor, she set her glass back down to find that Saligrix had already drained his and was pouring himself another. Ah, uh, I remember my academy days, said Saligrix, looking misty-eyed. I was quite the troublemaker, actually. I was not always the respectable and formidable master wizard you see before you, if you can believe that. Ninian bit her lip to keep from cringing. I'm sure you're familiar with the clock tower on the quad. Is that still there? he asked. 
Ninian pulled her data stream device from the pocket of her dress and, with a few swipes, projected a picture of the Belkaran clock tower above the table. This one? Saligrix, enraptured, rose from his seat and approached the image. Yes, yes, that's it. Exactly as I remember it, he said in a distant voice. The old wizard became lost in the image, and Ninian decided to not interrupt his reverie. As I was saying, Saligrix shook his head, one night the lads and I were feeling a little punchy, so we broke into the tower and hexed it. The next morning everyone woke up to the tower looking like this. He demonstrated by lifting his forearm and bending his wrist. It had gone limp. Ah, we had a good laugh about that one. As Saligrix laughed at his schoolboy prank, Ninian noticed how loose the old wizard's wrist was, as if it might fall off at any moment. Those were the days, Saligrix sighed. His eyes darted from the data stream device to Ninian and back. I don't mean to overstep, but I am quite fascinated by your device here. Would it be terribly inconvenient if I borrowed it for the night to examine it? Ninian paused, but figured she could live without her device for one night, and she was eager to ingratiate herself to the wizard who might determine her future. Of course. She showed Saligrix the basic navigation functions and handed the device over. Much appreciated. I am sure our collaboration will be a fruitful one. I will retire now, but I will see you tomorrow afternoon for lecture. Don't forget your morning chores. Saligrix left the dining room, a little wobbly from the wine, and disappeared into the dark stairwell. Back in her room, Ninian got out of her dress and into sleep clothes. She started organizing her notes from the day's lecture, but it proved too much for her tired brain on a sip of pixie wine. Instead, she let her imagination wander and sketched a few wild-looking creatures. Among them, a human face appeared, which she imagined Rodondo to look like. Where did you go? She felt a strange kinship with the former apprentice. Did you feel unsure about your appointment, too? Was Saligrix already going senile when you were here? Did you explore the woods? She lay down on her pillow. Gossama nuzzled her neck. Her eyes drifted to the chore list and to secure perimeter before she fell asleep. One day down, several hundred to go. <laughs>